Hello, my name is Gail Underbaki. I'm a registered dietitian at UW Health. I work in the preventive cardiology area, and I'm here today to give you some nutrition information, I hope helpful information, that we'll be emphasizing in the Go Red for Women Girlfriends Challenge. Here in, at UW Health in Madison, we will be working one-on-one -on -one with some of our Girlfriends Challengers, but we're thrilled to have many more of you following along uh, via the internet and other avenues, so we wish you good luck in your challenge, and I hope this information is helpful. So our topic for today is uh, titled Nutrition Strategies for Heart Health. We'll touch on quite a few different things today, recognizing that each one of you has your own individual risk factor profile for heart disease. So some of you may be affected by high blood pressure, some of you may be affected by diabetes, maybe it's cholesterol, maybe it's weight. Uh, each, of these, each of these risk factors requires a slightly different approach in terms of behavior and nutrition, but I'll try and touch on a little bit of each one of these so that you can take what's most appropriate for you, emphasize that, and design your own program. So first of all, let's look at the big picture. And uh, by big picture, I mean the entire eating pattern. How do we put together a meal, for example? So this illustration that looks a little um, uh, like an oval here, meant to be a plate, so kind of a circle instead. But the, the keys here are, first of all, the size of the plate. So you notice that we're referencing a nine inch plate, nine inch diameter, in order to help with portion size. And then also the proportions, what, what makes up the plate, how much of the plate is filled with what type of food. So you see that we're emphasizing vegetables to a large extent. We're encouraging that half the plate be filled with vegetables, specifically the low calorie, high nutrient type of vegetables. That one quarter of the plate be filled with a protein, and we'll talk a little bit more specifically about types, but lean proteins would be the the um, emphasis here, and then carbohydrates or starchy type foods. Again, we'll go over that in a little more detail, but these are quick energy foods. They're not evil. Uh, you can eat some of them and still be eating a very healthy diet. So again, portion and proportion. If we go into a little bit more detail about each one of these areas, as I mentioned with the protein, what we're looking for here is a good source of protein that doesn't provide a lot of extra calories or saturated fat because we know that that has a negative effect on our heart health. So lean meats, poultry, or fish can provide that kind of protein, but also beans, lentils, tofu, any other vegetarian sources of protein can also be a good source. Uh, dairy products are also rich in protein, but there are some dairy products like cheese, for example, which provides quite a bit of fat for the amount of protein that you're getting from it. So we have to uh, choose the lower fat versions of dairy in order to meet these protein recommendations. Some examples are listed there for your information. In the vegetable category there, as I mentioned, half the plate filled with vegetables. A variety is wonderful. The idea that when you're eating a meal, the closer your plate looks to a rainbow, the better it is. Each one of those colors of vegetables represents a different kind of nutrient profile. So if you've got a lot of colors, you've got a wide variety of nutrients on your plate. Uh, fresh or frozen vegetables tend to be the best because they're the least salted and the least cooked, so they retain the most nutrients. Uh, but canned vegetables are available with no salt added, so if that's the only kind of vegetable that you like, it's still worth eating. And there's a list of vegetables there for your reference. Down in the bottom, you notice there that it says high starch vegetables count as carbohydrates. So let's move to the carbohydrate section there. And again, the goal is no more than one quarter of the plate. And all these values, of course, are approximate but about one quarter of the plate filled with carbohydrates. So carbohydrates, typically we think of whole grains or grains in general. Uh, the guideline from the US Dietary Guidelines, they suggest that we should aim to make half of our grains, at least half of our grains whole. So whenever you're choosing 
bread, rice, pasta, if at least half the time they can be whole wheat or whole grain versions of those foods, that would be the best. And then you may notice there the starchy vegetables listed are potatoes, corn, peas, sweet potatoes, winter squash. So those would count as that starch. So if we can go back to the plate for a second, if you have a nice lean protein, perhaps it's chicken, maybe it's beans, like uh, black beans or something, you fill the, the half of your plate with some stir-fried vegetables, a variety of vegetables, and then if you had a um, some corn, for example, that might fill your carbohydrate category, and there wouldn't be a spot left for bread or other pasta or rice. So you choose the carbohydrate. Pick the one that you want the most and make that your carb for that particular meal. Uh, down in the left-hand corner, we're talking about fruits. And fruits are important as in the nutrient profile. They are, however, higher in calories and higher in sugar than vegetables. So they're not equal to a vegetable. And it is possible to get too many calories from fruit if you use large portions, if you snack on it almost exclusively. So that could be a concern. And we're certainly... Uh, also issuing a caution about juice because juice is very high in sugar, usually equal to the sugar that you would get in regular soda. So that's a consideration. Uh, small amounts of juice is, is the recommendation. Below the fruit, we talk a little bit about fat. So healthy fat specifically, uh, the more liquid a fat is, the better. So that's our recommendation in that area. Fat offers uh, flavor, it fills you up, it makes your meals more satisfying. So fat is not bad. If you choose the healthier type of fat, use it in moderation, it's certainly appropriate. On the right hand lower section of this chart, then there's a few comments about eating patterns. And many of these things you've heard, but just to reinforce that they do make a difference in how you feel, what your energy level is, how well you're able to, to manage your food intake. So um, there, it's listed, plan to eat at least four times a day. So three meals, one snack, or two meals, two snacks, whatever it is. Breakfast is important. You've heard that many, many times, and it's true. Uh, try not to wait longer than four hours between meals just because you can get quite hungry between meals and when you're the more hungry you are the less rational you are typically about your food choices so if you can keep that hunger at a moderate level it's easier to make the better healthier choices for yourself mentions how important fruits and vegetables are as fillers lots of fiber um, the sweetened dessert or sweet dirt desserts, excuse me, and sweetened drinks are also they're okay, but not in too large a quantities. And just in general, how important planning is, knowing where you're going to get your food. So again, kind of a summary here: heart healthy eating. Uh, we might say build your base on plant food. So vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, nuts. These all come from plants and the type of fat that they contain in general is safe, so you don't need to worry about that, plus they're a great source of fiber. Make your milk low fat, so when you do use milk, use the low fat or the skim versions of milk and cheese and yogurt, uh, sour cream, all those sorts of things. You'll get all the calcium, the protein, but you won't have the saturated fat and the calories. Flex your proteins. This means be willing to experiment with maybe some vegetarian proteins. You don't have to be vegetarian 100% of the time to get some of the benefit of eating vegetarian proteins. So maybe you have fish or poultry or meat most of the time, but maybe a couple times a week you have a beans and rice meal or you try something with tofu in it. And that's a great way to just experiment, to get some different flavors and to improve your nutrition one step at a time. Uh, limit solid fats. Now the reason for that is that fats that are solid at room temperature are saturated fats. Saturated fats tend to increase blood cholesterol. So the liquid fats, liquid oils, tend to be the better choices. And we've mentioned how important it is to control portions. So now if we can take a minute and look specifically at a couple risk factors for heart disease and talk about what the nutrition goals would be, 
and which foods would be involved. So the high LDL cholesterol is definitely a risk factor for heart disease. The higher those levels are, the greater the chance that, that some plaque will develop in the arteries. So what can we do from a dietary standpoint to reduce blood cholesterol, specifically LDL cholesterol? Well, we can limit saturated fat. So as we mentioned before, uh, fats that are solid at room temperature, so typically butter, the fat that's in cheese, the fat that's in whole milk, anything that has butter fat in it, uh, fatty meats, the meat, not only the fat that you can see on the outside of the meat, but also what we call marbled fat, or the fat that's sort of streaked in between the meat fibers. And then fried foods may be high in saturated fat, depending on what they're fried in. If you know what oil you're using, and you saute some foods with, say, canola oil or olive oil, then it isn't high in saturated fat. But in a restaurant, it's anybody's guess. Another issue with the high LDL cholesterol is the dietary cholesterol. Some of the cholesterol that we eat in food is absorbed and it goes into our blood. So foods like egg yolks, shrimp, and then meat in general, or any foods that come from animals, tend to contain a certain amount of cholesterol. And you can see the recommendations listed there, no more than four egg yolks a week, shrimp once a week or less, and then meat or poultry, because they both contain cholesterol, limited to that six to eight ounces a day is a general recommendation. On the next line down, we talk about the recommendation to substitute some unsaturated fat for some of your saturated fat. So in other words, we don't necessarily want you to eat a lot less fat than what you're eating now, but to change the type of fat that you're eating now. So when you take away some butter, add in some oil. Um, or include some nuts or some seeds or some avocado. So not everything you, need, you use needs to be a fat-free food if you're substituting an unsaturated form of fat. And generally, again, vegetable oils or foods that come from plants tend to be unsaturated. And finally, in terms of LDL cholesterol, if you can increase the fiber in your diet, specifically something called soluble fiber, which you might envision as a kind of a gooey, gummy substance. If you can imagine you took some oats, you cooked them up to make some oatmeal, and you cooked them a long time, they get kind of like gelatin-like, and it's that sort of fiber that's real beneficial in helping to control your cholesterol level and your blood sugar level. So any food that has that gummy sort of fiber in it is, um, it helps. It helps with the LDL cholesterol. And examples would be, besides anything that's oats, also barley, and then beans of any kind. So black beans, garbanzo beans, kidney beans, any kind of beans are going to be high in this soluble sort of fiber. And then vegetables offer some, and also actually fruits do too. So it's the same kind of food we've been recommending for other reasons, but specifically here, it's the fiber that can help drop your LDL level. Now if we take a look at triglycerides and blood sugar, we switch gears a little bit. Our, our focus here isn't as much on fat and the type of fat, but it's more on sugars, starches, carbohydrate type foods. So triglycerides are a kind of fat in our blood that are created from the food that we eat. So the extra energy that we eat that doesn't get burned off right away is converted to these triglycerides and they either stay in our blood and circulate in our blood or they get stored in our, in our fat tissue. If they stay in our blood, that can increase your risk of developing heart disease. So we wanna keep our triglyceride levels down. And then certainly uh, blood sugar, elevated blood sugar equals diabetes. So we would like to prevent diabetes or manage it as well as we can to reduce the risk of heart disease. So first thing on the list, fairly obvious, avoid sweet drinks. What may not be quite so obvious is the places where you find the sugar or what we would call 
a sweet drink. Most of us would think of regular soda as a poor choice because of the high sugar content. But fruit juices, as I mentioned before, most of them have at least as much sugar as regular soda. Also, many of these uh, fancy, expensive coffee drinks that so many of us love are also incredibly high in sugar. And now, recently, sports drinks or um, various forms of water, they're called water, but oftentimes they're sweetened. They may have other things added to them as well, but it's, it is certainly worth reading the label carefully to make sure that whatever liquid you're drinking most often, iced tea or tea in the bottles or the cans, it may be tea, but it's typically quite sweet as well. So take a close look at that. Uh, number two on the list is limit portions of starchy foods. Now we've sort of addressed that by looking at the plate at the beginning. And again, a quarter of the plate filled with starchy foods is just fine. It's not like you have to take them away. Um, some books you read will say no white potatoes, no white bread, no white pasta, and that's okay if you want to do that, but it's probably not necessary to be quite that restrictive. If you control the amount of starchy foods, that's the more important thing. And then specifically for triglycerides, if your body is a body that tends to make too many triglycerides, alcohol can make that worse. So for women, the general recommendation for good health is no more than one drink per day. And you can see on the right-hand side there, the one drink equals five ounces of wine. And some of those gigantic wine glasses that they have th these days, five ounces doesn't look like much, but that's, that's the amount that you should be aiming for. One 12 ounce beer or an ounce and a half of liquor would be considered one drink. Next on the list is high blood pressure. So high blood pressure can uh, be improved in many situations by reducing sodium intake. The recommendation for how much sodium to have in a day has been tightened a little bit in the last couple of years by national guidelines, and that's because the evidence supports the fact that a lower sodium intake would drop blood pressure, drop the risk of stroke and heart disease for quite a few people in our population. So in general, what the guidelines are suggesting is that if you can limit your sodium to 2,300 milligrams per day, that's the goal now. But ultimately, as food processors and restaurants start to reduce the sodium in the food that they offer us, the hope is that the average population intake of sodium in the U.S will eventually get to 1,500 milligrams per day. And if you want to be the most aggressive in order to help your blood pressure the most, that's what you would aim for. It would be 1,500 milligrams of sodium per day. So most people, when you talk to them about salt, they say, oh, I never put salt on anything. And that's good, but it doesn't address the salt that's in the processed food that most of us eat. The estimations are now that 70 to 80% of the salt we get in any one day is added by somebody else and not us. So things like uh, breakfast cereal, bread, salad dressings, um, all of these sorts of things, not to mention the obviously salty uh, ham, bologna, processed cheeses, and as listed here, frozen dinner, soups, sauces, pickles, obviously anything that's in a brine. Uh, those are also very high in sodium. And then foods eaten out, restaurant foods just in general, are much higher in sodium than what you would ever expect. There are references available for many of these restaurants, and you can check what the sodium content is for some of these things. Uh, but in general, if you truly want to limit your sodium at this point in time, you will not be able to eat out as often as you might like to because of the sodium content. So uh, sodium is one thing for high blood pressure. The next thing is something called the DASH diet, which DASH stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. And this was a research study where they looked at not only the effect of sodium on blood pressure, but also what would happen if people ate more fruits and vegetables, what would happen if they had two to three servings of low-fat dairy every day. And lo and behold, in addition to the blood pressure drop that they got from the sodium restriction, there was another drop 
from the increase in fruits and vegetables and the regular use of dairy products. So eating more of these foods helps drop blood pressure. The reasons aren't exactly clear at this point in time, but in general, it fits real well. These, these recommendations fit real well with other recommendations for good health, so at least it makes sense. Let's, let's work together and um, maybe accomplish some additional blood pressure drop. Uh, so what you would do then in order to implement the DASH diet, the fresh frozen, no salt added canned vegetables, fresh or frozen fruits, uh, low fat dairy again, rather than the high fat dairy, but including those foods regularly in your diet can be beneficial. And then uh, also with high blood pressure, limiting or avoiding alcohol can be beneficial. The reason that alcohol raises blood pressure is not real clear, but it's very consistent. So that might be worth um, taking a look at. And then in terms of weight management, uh, one of the things, of course, that we would start with would be to say calories do matter in spite of all the dietary approaches that you read about, the special books and all the types of things that are available, calories still make a difference. So for women in general, 15 to 1800 calories a day is recommended to lose weight. Um, and again, what's that involve? It's pretty much portions. As far as uh, meals, meal schedule, three at least three a day or more, the more often you eat, the less you can eat each time in order to keep your calories the same. So the regular meals, as we've mentioned before, are very important to keep your appetite in a moderate level, uh, three or more per day. Keep in mind, the more often you eat, the less you can eat each time. So the meals and the snacks need to be small to moderate size if you're eating more often, which I believe is the best thing to do. So hunger control, like we said with the regular meals, hunger control is better if you're eating more often, but also if your meals and your snacks include protein or some healthy fat or maybe some high fiber type food. So for example, if you had some nice uh, crackers, low in saturated fat that you liked and you decided you were gonna eat one serving of those crackers, well that's good, but they may have some fiber in them, but they're mostly carbohydrates. So your body's gonna use them up pretty quickly in terms of energy. Now, if you had maybe a few less crackers, but you put peanut butter on those crackers, or possibly you ate a low fat string cheese with those crackers, even for the same number of calories, you'll stay full longer because you've got some protein and or some healthy fat along with that carbohydrate. So that uh, combination of foods can make a big difference in how long you stay full. Another concept is something called calorie density. Uh, some foods, when you look at the volume you can eat and how many calories you get, you can eat a lot for almost no calories. And obviously, things like celery, um, carrots, lots of vegetables that you could fill up on large amounts, and you wouldn't get enough calories to make a difference. So a food that has a high water content, a high fiber content, tends to be low in calorie density. Foods that require lots of chewing are beneficial too because they slow you down. And as I'm sure you've read at one point or another, chew your food 20 times, chew your food 30 times before you swallow. Well, if, something, if you're eating something like celery, you almost have to or you'll choke. So this sort of reinforces that idea. Eat slower, chew more, recognize what you're doing in terms of eating. So these overall, these, these approaches can be beneficial for weight management. It's a complex process. It takes dedication and organization in order to put it into practice, but it doesn't have to be a specific diet plan in order to see success. Making small changes consistently can be enough to see the progress that you're after. So let's talk a little bit about goal setting. Um, and you could set a variety of goals. A common goal would be that you want to lose weight. Uh, so how much weight do you want to lose? How fast do you want to lose it? Be realistic. There are uh, many headlines, many websites that would tell you you can lose 10 pounds in two weeks. 
Maybe you can, but if you do, chances are you're either starving yourself so drastically you won't be able to continue, or you're somehow losing fluid weight, which won't stay off once you stop whatever kind of unrealistic approach you're using. So be realistic about what you expect to lose. If you lose a pound a week, that is awesome progress. If you lose a half a pound a week, that is also awesome progress. It does not need to be fast. Most people are looking for a quick solution, but chances are that's not gonna be a long-term solution. So the same sort of thing with cholesterol. You know, some people have elevated LDL cholesterol and they say, well, I can fix this with my diet. You might be able to, but then again, genetics do play a role in the LDL cholesterol. So if your goal is to do as much as you can with the diet before you consider medications, that, that's more realistic. If you can achieve a 10 to 15% drop in your LDL cholesterol with your diet change, that's pretty darn good. So again, realistic goals. Uh, be specific. As you know, if you're deciding you're going to change your eating habits, if you want to lose some weight, instead of just saying, I'm going to eat better, that's interesting, but it doesn't tell you what you're going to do. It doesn't allow you to assess whether you've met your goal or not. So maybe it means I will eat breakfast five days out of seven, or maybe it means I will carry my lunch to work more often. I'll eat out with my friends only once a week or something to that effect, but at least something very specific. And then I think another important process here is that you can reevaluate your goals periodically. So you set up these goals, okay, they sound good for now, things change. So rather than just giving up, it makes sense that you reevaluate those goals for this point in time and decide do they need to be revised. Rather than giving it up completely, if you step back, maybe slow down the rate of change that you're expecting a little bit, revise your goals, and then keep going, that's better. So setting your nutrition policies and priorities, again, we've mentioned things like um, regular meals and snacks, and it's kind of uh, a, a personal thing. What is, what will work for you? Because for some people, um, they, they can't carry their lunch. They're not gonna do it because socially eating out with their friends every day at work is really important. Okay, so that's, we can work with that. If you want to eat out every day, then you have to change what you eat out when you eat out every day. So there are ways to get where you want to be, but you kind of have to know what's your priority and then be willing to make some adjustments according to that. Drinking water instead of soda would be another general, you might call it your policies. You know how we all at work, we typically have policies and procedures. This is how we do things. Um, and it doesn't hurt to have some of those for your nutrition, your approach to nutrition and your approach to your health. Like your priority, your number one priority should really be your personal health, being the healthiest, happiest person you can be. So again, thinking about why and what you're going to be aiming for. Another concept that sometimes doesn't get um, discussed much is thinking about how are you going to deal with exceptions to the plan. So you've got this plan, it makes sense, it's realistic, it's specific, you've done all the things you're supposed to do, uh, but then there's the birthday or the family get-together or whatever it happens to be. And I think it's, it's very important to understand how to deal with those exceptions to the rule rather than saying that they're failure or denying yourself something that's quite important to you, recognizing that food does play an important role in our traditions and our celebrations. So planning for these exceptions, uh, recognizing that for something to be an exception, it can't probably happen three times a week. An exception really means something that comes up maybe once or twice a month at the most. So realizing that you can, you can make some uh, decisions that allow exceptions to your typical plan, but you can't do it every day or you won't be achieving the success that you're after. 
once you decide how you're going to deal with these special occasions and how, how are you going to fit that birthday cake in there, and then you, maybe you, um, there's a birthday dinner and you know there's cake, so you decide you're going to eat your hamburger without a bun so that you save those bun calories to cover the cake or something like that, great. Then no guilt. You can't get down on yourself about doing something like that because you planned for it. You made a decision, this is what's appropriate for me at this point, and then don't let that guilt or a feeling of failure climb in there because this is how you, you have to be able to deal with these exceptions and then move on. That's the important thing. So another important step to better health is in terms of planning meals and snacks. Um, I came to the conclusion a number of years ago that if I'm going to eat well, I have to take the responsibility. I can't just go through my day and expect to come upon good options for me wherever I happen to be. So if you make some choices, make some plans that allow you to be in control of what you're eating, that will help an awful lot. So for example, if you're on the road and you're out, um, you're traveling somewhere, so you're going across the state border, you're going to uh, visit family or whatever it is, well, you know you're going to have to eat on the road. So what are you going to do? Are you just going to stop at fast food and depend on that or go to the PDQ store and pick up some specific type of uh, a snack food there and carry that, let that carry you over? Or do you want to pack a cooler and bring some fruit and some yogurt and some maybe some baby carrots to munch on while you're driving, perhaps some nuts or string cheese. You don't have to have your whole meal in the car, but at least if you've got some choices with you, you can stop at the fast food, get a sandwich, come back to the car, have an apple and some carrots and make it a whole meal rather than depending on the french fries or the apple pie or whatever else it might be that's available in the restaurant. So that's an, uh, one goal that you could work on. And then another thing when you're running errands just out around town and something takes longer than you thought. You thought you'd be home in time to eat lunch or what uh, these errands took a little longer, somebody delayed you, the traffic got bad, whatever it is. So if you've got something in your car, you never get to that point of desperation where running through the drive through seems like the only, uh, only thing you can do to cope with the hunger. So things like nuts and dried fruit, fruit uh, sorry, nuts and dried fruit which can be stored in your car for long periods of time without worrying about spoilage. Um, always having water available with you because frequently people think they're hungry but they're actually just thirsty. So if you have some water that can help you feel more comfortable and help control that hunger until you can make a better choice. So planning ahead makes a big difference. And then grocery shopping, you've heard all of these guidelines before, make a list, don't shop when you're hungry, that does matter too. So I think that one's worth listening to. Read nutrition labels, and this might be a matter of, okay, I'll read the label, but what? There's a lot of information on there, do I have to look at all that stuff? And you probably don't, so I'll show you in just a minute. The idea that shopping the perimeter of the store is a good idea because that's typically where you find the least processed food. You got the meat, you got the dairy, you got the bakery. Uh, most of that stuff is on the perimeter. And if you go into the middle of the store, that's where you're gonna find all the processed foods. Now, one exception to that is that there are actually getting to be more choices in the area of processed foods, some that are lower in sodium, lower in calories, uh, improved in flavor too. So if you, if you do happen to get into that interior of the store and start looking around, just look for things that are new and different and be willing to try a couple of those. You might find some options that you enjoy. So here's this label, the nutrition label. And I would caution if you are in a store looking for something, um, again, new, that you don't depend on the front of the package to determine whether it's something you wanna buy. That's where the food is being sold to you. So all of the marketing comments, all of the um, selling aspects of the label, they're on the front. So they make it sound pretty darn good if you just look at the front. But if you turn this over and look at the nutrition facts section of whatever package you're looking at, that is so much more helpful. So some of the things you might 
pay attention to, depending on what your heart disease risk is and what your nutrition uh, uh, priorities are. So first thing, I think serving size, you gotta start at the top because everything else below, it goes back to that serving size. So what is the serving size? Sometimes looking at that servings per container can also be very helpful because that helps you sort of eyeball or get a, a visual picture of how much that serving would be. Calories are important for many people, not everybody, but you may wanna look at calories. When you get to the fat section, again, if you're trying to reduce your LDL, I would focus on the amount of saturated fat, not the total fat, but the saturated fat, and also trans fat, which we didn't really talk about, but that has a negative effect on heart disease risk as well. So rather than looking at total fat, if you just looked at saturated and trans, that would tell you pretty much everything you need to know. The cholesterol that's in food, as we mentioned, can raise the cholesterol in your blood, but it's not as potent as the saturated fat in food. So if you only have a limited time, I would say focus on the saturated and trans fat rather than the cholesterol. And then the sodium number, uh, that again, especially if you have high blood pressure, is an important number to look at. Potassium is actually a beneficial nutrient, so the more of that you get, the better. But in general, I would say it's probably a lower priority as far as label reading. Then you get to total carbohydrates, so again, the influence on blood sugar and triglycerides. And I would say read the total carbohydrate number on this example, 31 grams, instead of looking down to the sugar number, because the sugar is only part of the carbohydrate. And the effect of this food on your blood sugar and your triglycerides depends on the total carbohydrate number, not just the amount of sugar. And then dietary fiber may be of interest to, it's a little harder to interpret because the um, information we have available on dietary fiber isn't as helpful as what we can learn from the fat and the carbohydrate and the sodium numbers on this label. Uh, protein is interesting, but probably not a high prior priority in terms of your label reading um, efforts. So again, I think serving size, calories, saturated and trans fat, sodium, and total carb would give you a pretty good picture of what this food has to offer. So uh, uh, another process that many of us struggle with would be getting the meals on the table. Uh, you come home, you're tired, you don't have a lot of, a lot of time, the kids are crabby, <laughs> it can be quite a challenge. So I think just thinking about the process, analyzing it step by step, and where is it that you're struggling might be one of these areas. So in general, experts have actually reviewed the way that we, as in our society, the way that we cook or the way that we prepare meals. And in general, they find that we repeat probably eight or 10 meals. We repeat those over and over again. Um, so you don't need an unlimited number of recipes. Yeah, they're fun to make for special occasions, maybe on weekends, but in terms of survival, you probably need eight to 10 relatively quick meals that you can throw together that are nutritious, that you can get on the table before the family has a fit. So limit the number that you're trying to incorporate. That might be one helpful suggestion. And then once you've identified these eight to 10 meals, if you can stock your pantry with the ingredients for those meals. So your weekly grocery list should be almost like a checkoff. Do I have the black beans that I need for the chili that we like? Do I have the whole wheat pasta that I need to make the spaghetti meal that we like? So if you know that you've got those ingredients in your pantry, that can make it very easy. You get home, you start grabbing stuff out of the freezer, the, uh, the pantry, and throw together this meal in a short amount of time. Another issue uh, or suggestion would be what we typically call leftovers. But I know many of us, we cook on the weekends, we make a bigger batch of something, and then we've got planned overs that we can make into a meal later in the week. 
in a very short amount of time. So maybe you make a big batch of chili or you have some leftover beef stew and possibly you'll throw together a salad to go with the stew or maybe with the chili make some homemade cornbread to make it a little special the second time around. And all of those things can be done pretty quickly. So as far as this pantry, um, we've got the items that are probably most commonly used in those eight to 10 meals that we talked about. So thinking of proteins that are quick, that you could keep in the house and have available, things like frozen chicken, the chicken breasts, the frozen fish of various sorts. Some of them are now individually wrapped, so you can take out one or two fillets at a time. Canned tuna, canned chicken, canned beans can also be used to put together a, a meal very quickly. And then vegetables, the frozen vegetables, variety packs, there's all kinds of variety available now. Uh, canned vegetables without salt added or in terms of the canned beans, for example, the canned tomatoes, you can get the canned um, item but it doesn't have the salt added to it. If you know you're going to be eating at home several nights in the week, you can easily get some of the bag salad mixes and use those up in a reasonable amount of time for a quick meal. Fruits can be fresh. The low sugar canned fruits are definitely still worth eating. Yes, they're peeled and yes, they've been canned, but they do retain most of their nutrition. So if you get the ones in the light syrup, it's still worth using. Uh, dried fruits, again, great for snacks. Keep them in the car. Frozen fruits are wonderful on oatmeal or to use as a quick dessert if you want to put something together, a blueberry cobbler or something like that. Whole grains, um, there's, we've got our traditional grains in this country, it's rice, it's pasta, uh, but there's a, all kinds of different ones out there too. So if you're up for some experimentation, you could try different varieties and going to a bulk section, either in a grocery store or a natural foods type store, you can see different types of grains that you may not have used, things like barley, quinoa, uh, there's a lot of different choices that, that there's could be interesting for your family. And then finally, the flavorings that you might use for these different recipes. If you've got uh, fresh garlic, um, the ginger root, the fresh ginger root that you can grate into soups or stews or even salad dressing, uh, lemon or lime. Again, the, the canned bottled type variety of these things can be great. Uh, vinegars, all kinds of different vinegars that you can use to make salad dressing or even to drizzle over fish before you bake it. And then of course a variety of herbs and spices. And not to forget that these flavorings actually offer some nutrition. There are antioxidants or flavonoids that we talk about that protect us from uh, inflammation in our bodies and oftentimes herbs and spices as well as vinegar, ginger, these sorts of things will enhance our diet rather than just enhancing the flavor. They might have beneficial effects for our health as well. And that brings us to the end of this preparation, um, uh, this presentation today. It's only the beginning of your preparation, I think, but I hope that we've covered uh, enough topics that you can take away some information from this presentation that might be helpful to you. And just remember that it takes a little bit of planning at the beginning, that you need to be willing to um, put some effort into it. It's, it's learning a skill, eating well, is a skill just like any other skill, whether it be skiing or knowing how to run your computer or uh, um, quilting. All of these things are skills that take practice and nutrition and eating well is one of those things. We, we aren't born knowing how to do it well. So it takes a little time, it takes a little effort, but it can leave you feeling stronger and it can reduce your risk for heart disease. Thank you very much.